Welcome everyone and thank you for joining me for this seminar which will focus on my journey from being a man with nothing but a desk job and a dream to being a full-time best-selling author. I'm going to share with you my own experiences and the knowledge I've picked up since the beginning of my writing career. Some of what comes up you might already know but everything that follows is aimed at the indie author at the very beginning of their journey and it's all information I found useful and that I wish I'd known way back when. So let's get started. I've been writing for a little over four years. Uh, in that time I've produced seven novels, two novellas, two short stories and two box sets. I've also taught myself the business of being an indie author and publisher and for the last 14 months I've been able to live my dream of doing this full time. And in my career so far, all seven novels and the first of my two box sets have been bestsellers on Amazon. My fifth title was also a 2015 winner with Amazon's Kindle Scout programme and hit the number one spot in the pay Kindle store in three countries when it was released. Not for long, admittedly, but it got there, and that's what matters. For those few hours, I was king of the world. Now, whether you're just starting out, or well on your way, it's always important to stay dedicated and focused. But, you do need to be realistic. Very few traditional publishers, uh, traditionally published authors make a full-time living from their book royalties. And the average trad author will make less than $11,000 a year. Now, Indies have the opportunity to do much better than that, simply because we're paid monthly and not every six months. And a growing number of us do. But what you need to remember is that people like Lee Child and J.K. Rowling, uh, people like Mark Dawson and Rachel Abbott, they're the exception rather than the rule. They're the, the top 1% of the industry. Now, I started writing because I've wanted to do it ever since I was a child. When I finally started to see some movement in sales and began taking it seriously, my goal was simple, to be able to provide my family with a comfortable life by doing something I love. Now, I've worked in dead-end office jobs for over 16 years and I hated them all. I figured seven-figure advances, seven advances and movie deals would never happen for me, although it wouldn't be for life of trying. I mean, sure, making millions and I don't know, having Tom Cruise ruin the movie adaptation of my first novel would be great. But I wouldn't feel like I failed if I know things never happen. You should understand that this is one of the hardest ways to earn a living and it takes time to build up your income before you feel comfortable relying solely on your book sales to pay your bills. So don't be disheartened if your journey takes time. And don't think you've failed just because you don't make six figures every month. There are many levels of, of success and comparing yourself to your peers sometimes causes you to lose sight of how well you're actually doing. Now on average, I make a mid to high four figure income each month. Can I retire at 40 and buy a yacht? No, but I can do exactly what I set out to do and because of that, I consider myself a success. Now, all that being said, whatever your view of success is, it's 100% possible to earn a living wage from writing and I hope my experiences of achieving that proves useful to you. So let's, look, let's begin by looking at how I got started. More importantly, Let's start by looking at what I did wrong, right from the very beginning. Now when you start something new, there's always things that you're going to get wrong. Let's call them learning learning experiences rather than mistakes. But here are a couple of biggies I made. Okay, Now these are maybe common knowledge and probably common sense now, but when I was first starting out, I simply didn't know, and I wish someone had told me these at the time. Avoid vanity publishers. Now these are the people who ask you for money up front in return for publishing your book. But some of them may also offer to design your cover or edit your manuscript, even promote your book. But the upfront cost is usually extortionate and may also include an ongoing percentage of your royalties. Now, no legitimate publisher will ever ask the author for money in order to publish the book. And the ones that do tend to do a pretty naff job of it. Okay, we've all done it, be honest. We've all read through something we've written four, five, six times and thought, perfect, it's ready to go. No, don't do it. And here's why. You wrote it, which means your brain knows what should be written down and will automatically fill in the blanks for your eyes if something's missing. You can't be impartial to your own work and you should always get an independent set of eyes to review it before publishing, whether that be your editor or friends or family. Trust me, after seeing a flood of one-star reviews coming from my first novel, complaining about the quality of the editing, I soon realised I needed professional help. Not literally. 
Now, everyone learns from the mistakes, and here are the biggest takeaway points I have uh, after plenty of my own uh, mistakes in my early days. You can figure this out on your own, okay? Same way those vanity publishers did. There's a wealth of knowledge, help, and experience available to you online. You just have to know where to look. Now, there's detailed information on websites, uh, blogs, forums, about every step of the writing and publishing process, and it's well worth committing the time to finding it. Now, here are some examples of places that contain invaluable information to get you on your way. You've got the Creative Pen, managed by India legend Joanna Penn, and you've got Jane Friedman's website. Now, both of these are a gold mine of information about getting started and contain articles, blog posts, and podcasts on a whole host of topics that are well worth checking out. Now, there are numerous uh, Facebook groups that are helpful too, uh, places where indie authors can come together to form communities to help each other on their journey. One of the more popular ones is 20 Books to 50K, uh, set up by Michael Anderley. Now, these guys are great. They're always willing to help and they offer support and encouragement to their members. They've even got their own annual meetings, which is pretty cool. And finally, we have K-Buds. Now, this is a very popular and friendly forum community and again it's filled with knowledge and experience. Now, I learned a lot from these people um, specifically when I was going through the Kindle Scout process and the topics that are discussed on there um, are absolutely fantastic so get yourself a profile and soak up all that information and here is where you can find them all. Okay. So we've figured out where to go to learn the ins and outs of the industry that you're slowly becoming a part of, but to start the journey you need to start writing. Now, first thing you need to ask yourself is, what do you want from your book? Are you writing simply because it's something you've always wanted to try, like everyone has one good book in them, that kind of thing? If you just if you just want to get it down, tick it off your bucket list, okay, brilliant, good for you. Writing a novel, for whatever reason, is an incredible achievement. And you should feel immensely proud of doing it. But I'm guessing, since we're all here, that your answer is that you want to make a living as an author. And if that's the case, good for you as well. As with anything, it's not easy to be successful, but it feels easier if you enjoy all the hard work. So, what's the first step? Say I made the decision to stick to what I know. Now, I've been an avid reader for many years and I rarely strayed from reading a good thriller. So consequently, I've got a good idea what to expect from a book that advertises itself as being in that genre. Now, you need to be smart about starting out a new venture like this and the safest first step is to write the book you would want to read. Do you like sci-fi? Write the next Star Wars. Are you a fan of uh, Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones? Write a sprawling fantasy epic. See, personally, I couldn't write an historical romance novel if my life depended on it, so I'm not going to waste six months of my life trying to. Right from the beginning, you should be thinking of this as a business, and the first rule of business is to make a product people want. Think about who you're writing for and what they want from the book, and then build on that. Now, this next one is crucial. Make sure you have time to write. Now, it might sound obvious. But a lot of people still have full-time jobs and writing is still just their hobby. And a lot of people, they have families and other commitments. And being a writer doesn't mean that every other aspect of your life stops. So make time for yourself so you can spend even just an hour a day locked away in your own little world. I might say it sounds simple, but it's harder than you think. And it's very easy to try doing everything all at once. Now, remember, without the book, you don't have a business. Finally... You need to set yourself some realistic goals. Now, I know a lot of people who say they have to write 3,000 words a day, or 5,000, or 10,000. I know people who release full-length novels every month. And do you know what? Good for them. I can't do any of those things. And it's not that I'm not disciplined or committed, but having tried to write 5,000 words a day, I found it was very difficult for me to do. I put a lot of pressure on myself, and I found that not only was I not coming close to that target on a daily basis, but I felt like I was failing because of that, and it, I became very disheartened. So I found a way to keep working and keep motivated, but at an attainable level. So my personal target is simply to write one chapter every day. And it doesn't matter how many words, just one chapter each day. 
See, in all of my full length novels, they're never more than 35 chapters. So even if I'm doing one a day, that means I'm going to finish the first draft inside six weeks. Now, nobody knows you better than you, so be honest with yourself. Know your talent, know your limit. Make your style and your approach work for you in order to get the manuscript finished. Which brings me to the final point I want to make. Finish your manuscript. Now, I use the analogy that writing a book is kind of like getting a tattoo. Okay, You don't, you don't get a tattoo, you earn it. You reach a point where you want to commit something important permanently to your life. You then voluntarily subject your body to tremendous prolonged stress where an open wound is essentially traced across part of you. It hurts like hell for weeks afterwards, but in the end it looks amazing and you think, do you know what, I deserve that, I've earned it. It's kind of the same right in a book. It takes weeks, even months to complete it. It's difficult, it's complex, it's lonely. You constantly doubt yourself, going through periods where you think it's your best work and then moments later thinking it's your worst. And you choose to do that because you feel you have to. And it's nothing short of traumatic at times. But then you type the end. And in that moment you realise it was all worth it. You know, I can tell you honestly, hand on heart, after four years, uh, 12 books, the feeling you get when you see those two words on your screen is indescribable and never loses its impact. If you've done this already, you know what I mean. Um, if you're penning your first bestseller right now, you've got it all to come, okay? But keep at it. So let's fast forward a little. You finish your manuscript, you celebrate seeing the end on your screen, and now the hard work begins. See, editing your book is the most important part of the process. It shapes your story um, and moulds it into the finished product that you're going to sell to people. So it makes sure your plot develops at the right pace, makes sure your characters grow and they tell the story in the right way, um, that you've spelled everything correctly and there's no rogue punctuation marks floating around. You have to get this bit right. Now, there's an old saying, never scrimp on your footwear or your bed. Now, the reason for that is because you can buy everything else in life as cheaply as possible, okay? but not those two things, because no matter what you're doing, if you're not in one of them, you're in the other. So they're important. Now editing's the same. You should always work to your budget, but make sure you invest in a good editor and it'll pay dividends in the long run. Now, a good service won't be cheap, but you can find affordable ones that do a decent job. Because your goal should be to produce a product readers want to buy. And your finished product needs to be as polished as possible. So what you should do, take time to shop around Find the editing service that works for you. And make sure you audition them. Most good editors will offer to edit a sample of your work for free. So you can see their style, their standards, and decide if that's what you're looking for. And finally, there's a piece of advice I was given, uh, which, which is relevant to this part of the, of the presentation. See, it's easy to think that you know best all the time. At the end of the day, it's your book, it's your baby. You know everything about it. But sometimes you have to concede that your editor might be making a valid point or that their suggestion will actually improve on your original idea. Editing requires a very open mind. Okay, so just, just be aware. Now, cover design. Another important aspect of the process and arguably one of the most difficult to nail down. Because let's face it, after all, you do always judge your book by your cover, by its cover. Um, now, if, like me, you're not in the least bit artistic, at least in the graphical sense, this bit can be quite daunting. There are so many covers out there, and the majority of them look the way they do for a reason. So somebody told me once there are only seven different types of cover. You have the, you have the silhouette of a, a figure against the backdrop, you have scenic shots, um, you have a, a face kind of turning to look back at you, um, I can't remember the rest, but I remember them saying to me, if you go into a bookstore and you look at every book they have, I guarantee each cover will fall into one of these seven categories. And I did it, and they were right. So think about your own genre. Now, as a reader, what would you expect from your, your book to look like? Okay, Let, let's have a look at a few examples. So here we go, Lee Child, the main man in my genre, yeah? Now his covers, I mean, they're literally award-winning. 
They all have the same basic layout, which is perfect for branding. Uh, they're simple, but they're effective. They have the same style. Uh, you've got the backdrop with the, the silhouette of the guide. They've got a different colour scheme each time for variety. You can take one look at them and know that it's a Lee Child book. Um, or if, if you haven't read his work, you can probably hazard a guess at their thrillers. Okay, so let's have a look at another one. Vince Flynn. Again, master of the thriller genre. Same sort of thing to Lee Child's covers, which is okay. It's the same genre, so you'd expect them to look kind of similar. Uh, they all tick the same boxes. Helps identify the genre, the author, the series, all at a moment's glance. So, absolutely perfect. Now let's look at mine. There we go. So, same sort of thing to the others, really. Um, I've not got the silhouette of the guy, but other than that, you've got the uniform layout. You have a different colour each time to, to identify. They look smart, they're polished, uh, they're good for branding. They tick all the boxes. Um, for my genre. Now, I mean, I'm fortunate enough that I do get some praise for the quality of my covers, and I'm, I'm always very grateful for that, but let me get to the point that I'm trying to make. It's possible to get good covers on a budget, okay? That's important. You just got to know where to look for them. Now, a decent pre-made ebook cover will probably cost you around $150. Um, if you wanted a composite image made from scratch by a, a reputable designer or website, that could even stretch to $500. Those ones that Lee Child had, the award-winning, amazing covers, you're talking four figures easily. I know, right? Who can afford that? Okay, so, go on. Have a guess. Have a guess how much my covers cost me. Okay, whatever you're thinking, I bet you're wrong. You ready? Yep. My ebook covers cost me less than $50. Now, how is this possible? I hear you ask. Well, have you ever heard of Fiverr? Uh, with two R's. It's the site where people offer services starting at $5. That's how I did it. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of garbage on there. But if you take some time to search, you will find a diamond or two. And I found one. Now, I tell him basically how I want the book to look, and, and he puts it all together for me. Uh, for an additional $30, I'll get the, the wraparound cover for the print edition and the 3D graphic to use for marketing as well. Um, and it's one of those. It's no secret who he is. That's who he is. There you go. Tell him I sent you. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not on commission or anything. I just believe in his work. This guy would be a bargain at double what he charges. Now... Yeah, sure. Lee Child's covers arguably look better than mine, um, at least from an artistic point of view. But are they really two and a half grand better than mine? That's what you need to ask yourself. Now, having said that, even I understand that $49 is still a lot of money, especially when you're starting out. I think for the first year of, of my writing career, I was operating on $10 a month. Okay, um, So covers are important, but they can be done to a decent standard without spending a penny. Okay, you can do them yourself and you don't need to spend hundreds of pounds and dollars on software like uh, Photoshop or, or InDesign. I use these guys, Canva, to create all the images for my advertising. Um, you can create an account at no cost and you can get started straight away. Um, it's a really, really simple interface. It's kind of like a drag and drop version of Photoshop. All right, so it's dead easy to do. Um, I think they've got over a million stock images that you can use, and the majority of them are free. Some of them, um, you just pay a dollar for using that image once, um, and that's it. It's basic, it's simple. You can put something together that looks half competent in about 10-15 minutes, um, and, and away you go. And if you want more images, there are sites like uh, Deposit Photos, which are the, have a huge catalogue stock images that you can purchase and use so so don't be disheartened if you feel like you'll never afford something as good as what you see on a traditionally published title because you don't need to okay so we've looked at the exterior of your book now we need to look at the interior now this is something i've lost countless hours on trying to perfect and there was really no need for it now, when i first started out i was 
tweaking the Microsoft Word document for days at a time so it would upload to Amazon correctly. It's not ideal. Uh, but then, like everything else to do with publishing, there is a science behind it. So the first step is to decide on the right look for your book's interior. So think about your audience and what they would expect. So, for example, you can use uh, drop caps at the start and have a big, fancy first letter for the first paragraph of your chapter. But would a large, elegant-looking first letter look better in a sci-fi book or a romance book? Does a, a straight-up thriller need fancy fonts and graphics inside? And these are all things that you should consider before getting stuck into the process. Now, there are two main formats for your ebook's output. There is the Mobi file, which is used by Amazon, and there's the EPUB file, which is used pretty much everywhere else. And you also need to think about um, formatting your manuscript in a completely different way for the interior of your print edition. Uh, publishing platforms like CreateSpace, um, Amazon's KDP, uh, IngramSpark, they all have their own requirements and standards uh, for this process, which you have to learn and compensate for. So if you're going to go in alone, you need to understand it takes time and patience to get it right. But don't let that put you off if you're in a position where you want to save your money. There are plenty of tools available to you out there, um, along with blogs and guides online that provide detailed instructions on how to produce a professional book interior. And one of the most universally popular pieces of software is Calibre, which you can find there. Um, it's free, it works on all systems, uh, Windows, Apple, whatever, um, and it's pretty easy to use. You're able to produce a good quality ebook file in a matter of minutes. And, to, and you can also set it so that you have templates so future books can be done by literally pressing a couple of clicks. Now, there are alternatives to Calibre, uh, which, and they tend to delve a little deeper into HTML coding and that side of things. And whilst it will arguably produce a better product, it's a lot harder to learn. For me personally, when I was starting out, I wanted to make life as simple as possible for myself. So I stuck to Calibre. Okay, so another popular tool is Vellum, uh, which you can download from there. Uh, now it is for Apple users only, and it, it's a little pricey initially, um, but by all accounts, every writer I know with a Mac swears by it. So it's an option if, and it's an option that will give you a very high quality output quite easily uh, for every format you can think of. Okay, and finally, there is Scrivener. Uh, now that's a popular tool for for drafting your novel as well as for exporting it into ebook formats. And it's not easy to learn, but it is diverse, so that it's very useful once you know your way around it. I've also found a little tip for you. I've also found that if you hunt around online, you can normally find somebody offering like some kind of promotional code um, to get a bit of a discount when you download it as well. So you can do that to save yourself a bit of cash. Uh, so alternatively, you can give this irritating and time-consuming job to somebody else, which is now what I quite happily do. Um, now, I use Polgara Studios, and they offer a very professional, reasonably priced service, and they're very popular amongst indie authors. Uh, you simply send your manuscript and your cover, and they send you back a, a Mobi file, an EPUB file, and a PDF of your uh, print interior. Now, normally, that takes two or three days, and it's always under $100. Okay, you can find them. You can find them there. Um, and as always, you know there are lots of options out there, uh, all within different price ranges, um, all all different quality. I found these guys to be the best um, out of the ones I I tried. But take the time to look around and see what suits you. Okay, so we're getting closer now. Your book's ready to go. You just need to hit publish. But that's a tough decision to make. See, when I first started out, I researched all the options available to me and made my decision based on what I thought would work best. And before I get into that, I want to talk you quickly through everything I took into consideration before I made the choices that I did. Now, I'm going to share with you some numbers, uh, which I've taken from the authorearnings.com website, um, and they're based on quarter one of this year, 2017. So, to start with, you have four major ebook markets. You have America, you have the UK, you have Canada, and you have Australia. 
and this is the country's market share for all ebook sales in quarter one of this year. So as you can see, it's pretty heavily weighted towards that US market. Uh, now, for those doing the math, the remaining 1% is comprised of every other country. Okay, so these are the four, the four major ones. In much the same way, we have four major retailers. We've got Amazon, obviously. We've got Kobo, we've got Apple, and we've got Barnes & Noble. And again, here's the market share for all ebook sales, ebook sales across these four retailers. Now, yet again, dominated by one in particular. And for those of you doing the maths, the remaining 3% is made up of all other online retailers. Now, it's worth noting here that these figures aren't as one-sided as they first appear. For example, Kobo's 2% of sales actually accounts for almost three quarters of Canada's 4% of sales. So whilst those figures are a good guide, it's not as cut and dry as simply saying everyone except Amazon is rubbish at selling books. Now, I know many authors who make more money per month across the other three platforms than they do from Amazon alone. Okay, so let's look at your options. Your first one is that you can publish exclusively with Amazon using their Kindle Direct Publishing portal. Now, by doing this, you can opt into their select scheme which means you will gain access to promotional tools such as free giveaway days and countdown deals which allow you to showcase your book in a way that Amazon will support which will increase your title's visibility. And what you can also do is um, you can enter your titles into the Kindle Unlimited subscription program which means you'll not only get paid for every sale as normal but you will also be paid for every page somebody reads on their Kindle if they download your title as part of their subscription. So this essentially gives you two audiences and two revenue streams from one retailer. Now, alternatively, you can go live. And by that, I mean you can publish your title everywhere else. So you'll be on Kobo, which is, they dominate the Canadian market and they perform better than most in Australia as well. Um, you'll be on Apple and you'll be on Barnes & Noble, although it's worth noting they are um, they only service the United States. So, oh, also, depending where you are in the world, you can go on Google Play. Um, now, you can't go with them directly in the UK. Um, you have to use uh, a third party, but other countries do allow you to do so. And that is something else to consider if you do go live, whether or not you go direct, or if you want to go through a third party website, such as Draft Digital, uh, smash words or pronoun. Now the way it works is you effectively publish your title to them and they will then publish it on your behalf to a large and growing number of retailers. Now, it saves you a hell of a lot of time and it expands your reach much further than you could on your own. Now the cost of this, certainly in the case of Drafter Digital, is that they will pay you 60% of the royalties instead of the usual 70% that you get with going direct. It's also worth noting at this point that I would recommend going directly with Kobo and Apple if you can, because that will open up promotional opportunities on those platforms that you otherwise wouldn't have if you go through a third party. With Kobo, they're very easy to work with and the promotions are fantastic. Uh, with Apple, you have to be an Apple user to publish directly. So if you're like me, if you're a Windows guy and you don't have a Mac, you, you have no choice but to go through a third party. So, once you've decided how you're going to publish, you then need to think about what's going to happen when you do. Now, your first task is to establish yourself. You need to turn yourself into a brand and attract readers. Now, a good way of doing this is by getting yourself a website, which is straightforward enough to do using platforms such as WordPress or Wix. And this can be done very easily um, on a budget. Both of these services start off for free, and you have the option to pay for a more premium subscription if you need it. Now, I personally went with Wix because I found the interface far simpler to wrap my head around than WordPress. Now, it did take some time putting it all together, but it was worth it in the end. Okay, With your website, it acts like a hub. It's a one-stop shop for everything a potential reader could need. It's got links to your books, it's got information about you, it's got how to follow you on social media, and the most important one of all, it's got how to join your mailing list. Now, you can ask any author what the most important thing is when it comes to building your literary empire. 
and they will say build in a mailing list. You can use subscription services such as MailChimp or MailerLite. Again, both of which start off for free and they'll begin charging you when you reach a certain number of subscribers. Now, these guys are your audience, they're your audience. They're the ones that you tell first when you've got a book to release or if you've got an upcoming promotion and they're vital to your long-term career. So if you treat them right, they'll be your mouthpiece to the world. Okay, so start building your list from day one and focus on growing it. Now I dedicate a percentage of my advertising budget to getting new subscribers. Now, there's no immediate return for the cost, but I'm confident that if someone takes the time to join my list, the chances are they're gonna read my books. Now, if we're assuming that every subscriber at some point will buy all of my books, that means with seven titles and two novellas on sale, each email address will eventually generate around $30 of revenue for me. And that is well worth spending 50, uh, $5 a day on, which is what I do. And for that, I will get 15 to 20 new subscribers every day. So in order to start growing your audience, you need to give them a reason to invest in you. Now, you want them to share your per their personal information with you and you want them to buy your products. So you have to make it worth their while. What I did, I wrote two, um, two 10,000 word short stories purely to give away to new subscribers. So that incentive, that appeal of something that's just for them, works really well in attracting new readers to my series. And then once they're on board, take the time to get to know them. Interact with them on social media, send out newsletters updating them on your life as an author. More often than not, my emails contain very little about my books and more about me and my life. My readers always email me and contact me and wish me happy holiday or happy birthday. Or in one instance, it was to ask if their daughter could quote a passage from one of my books for a school project. It was brilliant. But the time I invested in getting to know them and letting them get to know me means that when I do have a new release, they jump at the chance to buy it. And not just because they're anxious to read it, but because they genuinely want to help me out. And that is invaluable. Now it's also worth taking time to get to know the industry because remember you're not just an author anymore you're a publisher now, publishing is a growing and ever-changing industry and it's vital that you keep up to date with how things are working and progressing so you can make the most of it when it comes to your own work now this is something that it changed my life both personally and professionally i've i've made so many friends since becoming a writer because us writers are a rare breed, you know, introverts by design and OCD to a fault. Most people I know who aren't writers don't really understand what we do, so it's hard to thrash out ideas and, and share news and things because some of the impact is lost. So it's good to have a network of people you can talk to within the industry uh, about the industry so you can exchange ideas and, and share your achievements with. Because remember, we're not competing with each other here. Okay, Look at people like like Mark Dawson and Joanna Penn, the success they've had is amazing and thoroughly deserved. Now they spent time learning every aspect of this business inside and out and then used that knowledge to take over the indie publishing world. Now they would have been well within their rights to keep what they learned to themselves. You know, If you stumble across a secret sauce it's understandable that you might want to keep the rewards for yourself, but they didn't. They shared the knowledge because they want other people to succeed in the way they have or even better than they have. And that's the mindset in the authors in the authors have, because remember, we're not just authors, we're readers. And like every other reader, you enjoy lots of different authors. So just because somebody reads your books doesn't mean they won't read mine as well. Yeah, I'm not losing anything by helping you. My sales aren't going to dry up just because uh, people are finding ways to poach readers away from me or something. That's why I'm honoured to be able to present to you today. I've had lots of help to get me where I am and I always jump at the chance to, to pay that forward and to offer help where I can. Now there are loads of communities on social media where you can do this. Um, I mentioned the 20 books to 50k guys before um, and you've also got the Alliance of Independent Authors who make, it, make a point of uh, bringing writers together uh, just like this and to help them learn, grow and succeed. So take the time to join in. Okay, so now we're into the nitty gritty. The, the last step that I think you should consider before we take a look at the exact path I chose that led me to where I am today. 
Nick Stevenson. So discovering this guy changed my writing life completely. He offers a course that, that's aimed at authors who are just starting out and it helps them build a platform on which they can establish a career for themselves. Now a lot of the things I've, I've talked about here stem from the lessons that I learned from Nick. Without his help, I wouldn't be where I am today. So you can find his course there. Uh, I personally think it's well worth your time and investment. Okay. So that's everything I've learned and everything I researched and took into account before embarking on my own journey. So how did I go from writing, having written nothing to writing for a living within five years? Okay. So my first step is this. Now to me, that was a no brainer. Three quarters of all ebook readers are American. Now, I don't have the resources to publish my books multiple times in both US English and UK English or any other language, come to mention it. So if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna start by catering to the largest reader base and then go from there. Again, the same logic applies with this one. Amazon are the biggest retailer, so it made sense to go with them. I figured if I target the largest reader base on the largest retailer, I'm giving myself the best possible chance of an early success. I also put into place the things that I learned on from Nick's course. Uh, on the March 23rd, 2015, I relaunched the first three books in my series, which was all I had at the time. Um, they'd been re-edited properly this time. Um, they had new covers and they were backed up by a new look uh, or singing website. Um, I also made the first book free and I use links in the back of my books to tempt readers to join my list. And finally, I optimise my Amazon product page, my search keywords and my metadata, which are all little things which I know are standard practice nowadays, but for me, all alone and naive in 2015, it was all new information. Okay, You don't know something unless you're told, right? I just want to highlight something there as well. You should always have sign up links in your uh, in your books to your mailing list okay that's a given now a lot of people i know put them in the front and the back of your book but what i do is i advertise the mailing list in the front but i only put the sign up link in the back i say something to the effect of join my list and receive two exclusive short stories sound interesting details are at the back of the book okay now let me tell you why i do that Let's say a potential reader, someone who's never read your books, is checking out your look inside preview on Amazon. Okay, They see your sign up pitch and they click it thinking it sounds like a good idea. Chances are they'll be getting something for free for doing so, right? So why not? Now, they might go on to buy your book. They might not. If they buy it, they might like it. They might not. But by clicking on the link in the front of your book, they're joining your list purely because they're getting something for free, not because they like your books. Remember, at this stage, they still haven't read them. So that means the odds of keeping that reader are against you right from the start. But if they click the link in the back of the book, they have to read your book first to get there. Now, again, they might click it, they might not. But if they liked your book, and let's face it, why wouldn't they? They're already invested in you, which means they're more likely to click the link and more importantly, choose to remain on your list when you start asking them to buy other things. Now, you might not get as many subscribers, but the ones that you get are more likely to be there for the long haul and not just because they like something for nothing. Does that make sense? Okay. So, how did all that preparation and those tough decisions work out for me? Well, in August 2015, I landed a book club featured deal. Now, I'm sure we all know how useful these things are as well as how difficult they are to get. In four and a half years, I've had two and I submit every book I have to them every month. Okay, so that's a, that's a lot of rejection. Um, but the first book that I got was for my free title, and in 24 hours, it amassed over 26,000 downloads, which put it at number one in the free Kindle store in six countries. Now, in the five weeks that followed, my sales skyrocketed, giving me the beginnings of a successful career. And it wasn't just sales that grew. I also gained just over 4,000 new mailing list subscribers in about a week, which again, that gave me a whole new audience for me to market my books to. And this was where I really started to see some return for my hard work and investment up until this point. 
as well as a bit of light at the end of the tunnel that you know maybe I could turn this into a career so the message so far is really that it takes a lot of work and a bit of luck to find success at this stage things were going well for me but I wanted more I was releasing new titles as often as I could I knew there was another level of success to be had I desperately wanted to know how to attain it and that's where this came in now most indie authors know Mark for his work with Facebook advertising and joining his course gave me that last boost I needed to turn my career into a full-time gig. Now I met Mark and his team at the London Book Fair in April 2016 and his Facebook ads for authors course, as it was known at the time, was due for, to open for enrolment in June. Well, you can find the details there. Um, now his self-publishing formula uh, course, his programme, it covers everything you need to start advertising on Facebook, uh, on Amazon, and they work especially well if you're exclusive with Amazon because they're a great way of boosting your page reads, um, which adds to your visibility. And very soon, uh, it will have a course on BookBub advertising as well, thanks to the legend that is Adam Croft. Now, BookBub ads can perform very well when advertising titles on other platforms such as Kobo and Apple. Um, you tend not to see as good a result for Amazon titles as you do on other platforms. Now, I lost my full-time job in June 2016 and shortly after I joined the course. Naturally, panic set in. It was my primary source of income and whilst it wasn't always more than my royalties at that stage, it was guaranteed every month it was safe. So when I lost that, I got scared. I then thought, I'm almost there with this right thing anyway, so we'll give it a month and we'll see how it goes. So I blasted through that Facebook course. Okay, and then I released a box set containing the first three books of my series and I implemented my newly found knowledge to create a Facebook campaign and I never looked back. Within three weeks I was earning four times what I earned per month per month from my old full time job. All thanks to that course. Now Facebook advertising it's not an exact science. In my experience what works for one person very rarely works exactly the same way for somebody else. It takes time but the course helps you and it really does make a difference. So whether you join the course or not, when it's open for enrollment, it's up to you. Okay, I owe Mark a lot and I'll always say a kind word about his efforts, but there are plenty of free resources online to help you navigate uh, Facebook's, Amazon's and BookBub's advertising platforms so you can get your own ads up and running. Explore them at your own pace and only commit money you can afford to. But make no mistake, Okay. Advertising on social media and retail platforms like this is the most effective way to consistently boost your sales and take your business to the next level. But that said, it's not the only way. Okay, You do have other options, such as BookSense, eReader News Today, uh, Freebooksy. Um, these are all websites that are geared towards book advertising and are very useful for short-term boosts to your business. These sites, and many, many more like them, all have their own substantial reader base that they market to every day. And it's a prime example of how a good mailing list can make a big difference. The prices vary, as does performance, but they're usually all pretty good value for money. I've not included BookBub here, simply because we know how hard it is to be accepted there, but I've always seen good results for free and 99 cent titles on ENT and BookSense, uh, free books it does okay. Uh, Bargain Booksy, which is their kind of 99 cent sister site, um, not so much in my experience, but everyone's different, and I know some people who, who swear by them for discounted titles. As always, have a look around, see what works for you, and give it a go. You also have uh, dedicated Facebook groups, which you can join as an author to post about your books. And these books are seen by readers and can be shared by other authors to increase the post visibility. In my experience, I've found these to be less effective than a, a mailing list focused campaign, but they're free, so you're losing nothing by hunting for a few groups to try your luck in. What I would do is have a look at the number of members that they have and also see if there's any author friends in there that you know. That's a, a pretty good indication of whether or not it's a decent group to join. And don't forget your own mailing list. Now by this stage, it'll be growing by the day. 
Um, so there'll always be new people to reach out to who might not know about all of your books. So what I've taken to doing, including um, advertising banners at the bottom of every newsletter that I send out, and one of them directs people to my main book page on my website, and the other prompts them to join my Facebook group. There's always a little spike in sales as a result of sending out an email campaign now, which is which is very useful. And for the adventurous, you have video ads. Now, these are doing great for people on Facebook at the moment. And whilst there are services that can produce book trailers for you of varying quality and cost, all you really need is your mobile phone and a good sales pitch. Uh, sometimes the personal approach of you addressing the reader directly on camera can work just as well, if not better than a fancy old singing or dancing video trailer. Now, those are just some of the tools and services available to you to promote yourself and generate interest in your brand, but there are alternative strategies to targeted promotion. A popular one is working with fellow authors to help each other out with cross promotion. So if you find a, a small group of authors who write in a similar genre to you, reach out to them, suggest organising a, um, a retweet party on Twitter or uh, marketing to each other's own mailing list. That will open up a whole new audience to you because don't forget, no reader exclusively reads one author. Now another method is using a service like Insta Freebie, which organises large scale social media campaigns that target readers and offer them multiple books from different authors for free. Now these tend to be genre specific as well, so and if they're done well, you can you can yield good results. But with that said, I've found there are good and bad points to this particular strategy. Yes, it increases your reach and it allows larger audiences to gain exposure to your product, which is great for you. But, and this is a big but, these promotions are geared towards readers who predominantly look for free books. This means that the, the new audience that you gain is less likely to want to hand over some hard-earned cash when it comes down to it. Now, a few months ago, I took part in my first one of these giveaway promotions, working with four other authors that I knew quite well. And we arranged it between ourselves, and over five days, I gained just over 3,500 new subscribers to my list. Well, that, that's a great result, but it's not as great as it sounds. If we fast forward a little bit, uh, two weeks and two email campaigns later, almost two-thirds of them had unsubscribed. Why? Because I wanted them to pay for the rest of my books, and they weren't interested. Now, they weren't what salespeople would call a quality lead, a warm lead, and my unsubscription rate went through the roof. But that's just me. I know authors have had similar experiences, and I also know authors who praise the, the opening click rates and the interaction of emails sent to people they got through a method like this. The bottom line is, it's definitely worth a shot, but be aware that however many subscribers you gain, it might not be the most useful in the long run. Now, something else that's popular at the moment is getting together to make a multi-author box set. Now, this is a strategy people use to hit a recognised chart like the USA Today bestseller list, for example. Now, the idea is simple. You get a group of authors to include one of their books in the box set. You price that box set at 99 cents. Everybody who's taking part contributes to the marketing and promotional costs. And then you publish it and share the rewards. Now, some indies view this as a cheap tactic just to get recognition, um, whereas others see it as a proven strategy that boosts visibility. I've, personally, I've never done it, and I've got no ill feelings towards people who have. At the end of the day, if it works, it works. So, we're well on our way. The books are published, your sales are coming in, your market uh, mailing list is growing, you might be full-time already, or you might, you might be on the cusp, and you might still feel you're a ways off. Whatever stage you're at, it's important to remember that this isn't a race. It's a big decision to go full-time and it's a scary one, so don't do it unless you're confident you can sustain it. But full-time or not, by now, you are running the business and your primary goal should be to make money. Okay? You need to manage your royalties sensibly. List your expenditures and budget accordingly. Slow and steady growth of advertising budgets is the most successful approach. If you throw everything into everything you have into one Facebook campaign and it doesn't work, then you're screwed. So take your time, only commit the money you can afford to, 
test it to see if it works and then plan to increase it if it does. Now, it's important to remember writing isn't the only thing that you do, okay? Because now you're no longer just an author. You're a marketer who advertises, who has advertising campaigns that they need to monitor. Um, you're a publisher and you've got a growing industry that you need to understand. You need to manage every aspect of your writing career. You need to build on what works and you need to look to improve what, what doesn't. You need to remember that you're a brand, you're a product. I'll always be thinking about different ways in which you can turn your product into something people want. Now, let's look at a movie as, ex as an example. Okay, A movie isn't just one thing. It's, it's a cinema release, it's a DVD release, um, it's then broadcast on television so the rights are sold. Um, it can be turned into a book, it can be a computer game, it can be a graphic novel. Lots of different ways that you can interpret that one product and you're no different. You have the potential to generate multiple revenue streams by turning your manuscript into an ebook, book uh, into a hardback or paperback, into an audio book, um, into a box set. These are all ways to share your product with the world. And your goal is to increase visibility of yourself, your product and your overall brand. Because remember, you as the author, you're as much a part of that brand as your book is. So have a look online for people with blogs or podcasts that you can reach out to and request interviews with so readers and fellow authors can get to know you. The more they know about you, the more they'll care. And the more they care, the more support and money they'll invest in you. You should always think about how you can improve and build on what you have. No business settles for how things are. When, when I had my first three-figure month, I nearly cried with happiness, but the next day, I wanted to know how I could make the next month a four-figure month. Always look for ways to grow your business. And finally, remember that karma is a thing, okay? Now, as we've said, you're not competing with anyone, so make sure that you remain ethical towards other authors and your readers. Now, yes, some authors can be idiots, and yes, some readers can choose to leave a scathing, thoroughly inaccurate one-star review, but you need to rise above it and move on. Nothing is anonymous online these days, and you don't want your name associated with bad press or negative feedback or any drama within the indie community, so keep your nose clean. You should always try and share what you learn with the authors that you know. That's how this community grows, uh, by working together and giving back. Now, I ask for help every day. And I always make sure I find time to provide it if anyone ever asks it from me. So, there you have it. An open, honest and detailed look at my journey. The choices I made, the information I found and the lessons that I learned along the way. Now I just want to take a moment to impart some final pieces of advice to all the authors out there. A few nuggets of wisdom and ways of thinking that I apply to my own writing life and, and my business that I think might be of some use. The first one is to take yourself seriously. Now building a business, any business, isn't something you undertake lightly. Okay, You're not doing this for a laugh, you're doing this to succeed at something that you're passionate about. And if you believe you will succeed, then you will. Having the ability to tell a story with that's worth selling is a talent that few people have. And being able to turn that talent into a living is a blessing that even fewer people get to experience. So embrace it and enjoy it. I rarely meet people who can honestly say that they enjoy their job. I'm lucky enough to be one of them and I'm very grateful for that. So we know it takes hard work and dedication, but remember that at this stage writing is your job, so try and treat it as such. Most people stop work at 5 o'clock every day. Most people don't work weekends. I found it hard at first making the transition from writing being a hobby that I squeezed in wherever I could to it being a day job. I thought I had to work every hour of the day in order to justify myself. And it drove me and everybody else insane. Now, now, I treat it like any other job. I run my own business, I work 9 to 5 Monday to Friday, and I'm much, much happier. I mean, what's the point of making good money from something, especially something that you enjoy, if you can't live a little? And finally, keep writing. Don't get too caught up in the business side of things. It's all important, that's what we've covered, but you need to find the balance and remember that it's the books that make the business. 
And that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege to be a part of this event, and I hope you've been able to take away some useful information from my experiences. And my email address is on the screen, so please do get in touch if you have any questions, or if you just want to drop me a line and say hello. Okay. So thank you very, very, very much again, and good luck out there.